It's October 30th, 1973, and a man called John H. Douglas is driving with his son at approximately 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Halloween is a mere day away, but for John Douglas, the spooky season has come a full day early. As John Douglas is driving with his son, a monologue begins to play from comedian George Carlin. The monologue being played featured the now famous seven words you can't say on television. Needless to say, the routine featured some words that many would consider vulgar. In any other car, the radio station may have just been changed if the language was too harsh. But this was no ordinary car, because it belonged to John Douglas, a concerned citizen and a member of Morality and Media, a political group set on protecting Americans from dangerous things like masturbation and being gay. Oh, Jesus Christ. The events of October 30th, 1973 would spark a series of events culminating in a Supreme Court case that aimed to answer the question, quote, does the First Amendment deny government any power to restrict the public broadcast of indecent language under any circumstances, to which the Supreme Court answered in a vote of 5-4, to four, no. When the commission finds that a pig has entered the parlor, the exercise of its regulatory power does not depend on proof that the pig is obscene. And just like any memorable Supreme Court case, this of course leads us to Family Guy. <laughs> If you've seen Family Guy, then you know that it can lean into its dark and edgy humor a bit too much sometimes. That and it loves a good poop or fart joke. When it comes to censorship in Family Guy, there are plenty of examples of scenes being edited or removed from episodes, and there's even a couple of episodes of Family Guy that were banned. When You Wish Upon a Weinstein was originally supposed to air in 2000, but Fox was worried the episode would be seen as anti-Semitic, so they decided to shelve it. The episode finally aired a few years later in 2003 on Adult Swim, and it eventually found its way onto Fox in late 2004. The other banned episode of Family Guy was Partial Terms of Endearment, an episode focused on the topic of abortion. With the sensitive subject matter in mind, Fox decided not to air the episode in the United States. While Partial Terms of Endearment did technically air at one point in time in the UK, it was barred from airing on Fox in the United States, as well as on Adult Swim per the request of Fox. There are a ton of interesting little factoids when it comes to censored Family Guy jokes and episodes, but I'm not going to focus on any of these much for this video. There are plenty of other videos out there cataloging these censored episodes and jokes, and frankly, I don't have a whole lot to say about a lot of them. As it turns out, most instances of censorship in Family Guy are pretty underwhelming. Sure, the subject matter might be shocking, distasteful, or downright gross in some cases, but Family Guy already has so much shock and gross-out humor that none of these censored moments feel that noteworthy. Instead, I want to focus on one of Family Guy's most iconic episodes, Season 4, Episode 14, titled PTV, an episode that, in the words of Seth MacFarlane, came out of rage. But why exactly was this an episode born out of rage? To answer that question, we first have to answer another. And that is, what exactly is it that the FCC actually does? The Federal Communications Council, or FCC, is a government agency that oversees all international or interstate communications of satellite, radio, wire, cable, and of course, television. After the Supreme Court ruling in FCC v Pacifica, the case we went over briefly at the start of this video, the FCC was granted the authority to restrict things that were considered indecent. What's indecency exactly? Well, technically, it's just this. Being indecent is not conforming with generally accepted standards of behavior or propriety, or just being obscene. But for the FCC, it's actually something a bit more confusing. You see, the FCC can't just say something is indecent or profane and call it a day. They have to make an actual case for each instance in question. The FCC describes what they're looking for on their website, and they say, quote, The FCC defines indecent speech as material that, in context, depicts or describes sexual or excretory organs or activities in terms patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium. Thus, indecency findings require two fundamental determinations. First, the material alleged to be indecent must fall within the subject matter scope 
of our indecency definition. That is, the material must describe or depict sexual or excretory organs or activities. Second, the broadcast must be patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium. Now, I know what you're thinking. What the hell does that mean? And I, I'm kind of in the same boat here. It's very, very wordy and a little bit unclear. But what I've garnered from this is that basically the FCC is looking for things that show, allude to, or describe matters of the sexual or excretory persuasion. Now, that's a bit of an oversimplification, and it's defining it based off words they used, so it's not super helpful. And I will remind everyone, I'm not actually a lawyer, so I'm not super sure about a lot of this stuff but we need to talk about this to talk about the episode of Family Guy we're talking about, so I'm a little out of my depths here. But the way I've unpacked these statements from the FCC seems to show a primary focus on matters of sex and bodily functions. Excretory is a term that comes from the excretory system, as in excretion, as in pissing, and while medically the excretory system doesn't include the process of defecation, which again, I must point out, I'm not a lawyer or a doctor, so this is just my interpretation of the words based on my research, but I think it's clear the FCC is talking about the whole umbrella of bodily waste. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. Most curse words and expletives have some tie to either bodily functions or sexual acts. When it comes to discriminatory language such as slurs, I've had some trouble finding a straight answer on the FCC website, but it's really not that important for the purposes of this video. What is important, though, is the fact that the FCC has to balance everything they do with the First Amendment. You know, that really important one uh, about speech and stuff. Now that we have a rough, and trust me, I mean rough, understanding of what it is the FCC actually does, we have to look at their history in American television up to the point of PTV. According to a timeline put together by Tom Head on the website ThoughtCo.com, the first indecency fine wasn't handed out until 2001, at least in the world of television. The station WKAQ-TV was fined $21,000 for violating FCC rules. And I bet you're wondering, what channel is WKAQ-TV? It's Telemundo, as in NBC-owned Telemundo. The fine was handed out because of a series of comedy skits that aired in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Not exactly a humdinger of a case or a fine, but it tells us something very important about the FCC. Up to this point, TV was fairly safe from fines from the FCC. But that doesn't mean TV was safe from the rules the FCC put in place. Just because a bunch of fines weren't being handed out doesn't mean TV channels could get away with anything. It just means that the FCC up to this point wasn't too trigger happy with fines. Network censors were still doing their job giving notes and questioning content that went onto TV. However, this would all change in 2004 during the Super Bowl halftime show. This was the event that sparked the rage within Seth MacFarlane that led him and the team behind Family Guy into creating PTV. During the 2004 Super Bowl halftime show, Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson made a bit of an oopsie on stage. There are a lot of theories and speculation about the motivation behind this incident, but the reasons aren't really important, and I'm sure if we found out the actual reason, it'd be pretty stupid. Janet Jackson's boob was exposed for less than one second, and the term wardrobe malfunction was coined. And no, the nipple wasn't exposed. I know one guy out there is frantically searching right now for the image, it's not worth it. It's just a breast, calm down. However, much of America didn't see it as just a breast, they saw it as a sign of the eventual collapse of society. The FCC was flooded, and I mean flooded, with complaints. Just look at this graph from Wikipedia. This single incident was hit with a $550,000 fine. And from this point on, the FCC was in crackdown mode. No more indecency, no more vulgarity, no more senseless nudity or violence. It was time for a new reign of terror for the FCC, 
and Family Guy didn't want anything to do with it. PTV is an episode dedicated to the frustrations of the team behind Family Guy. Imagine trying to write an episode of Family Guy with the now all-seeing eye of the FCC pouring over every joke and gag. The massive fine handed out after the 2004 Super Bowl halftime show left a lot of the big networks uncertain about what they could get away with on TV, so they were planning on handling things as safely as possible. Naturally, the safest approach isn't exactly what the team behind Family Guy had in mind. While I may insist that Family Guy's formula for making episodes is incredibly safe, the show's style of comedy is anything but safe in the eyes of a censor. In the full quote from Seth MacFarlane I mentioned earlier, when asked about the process of coming up with ideas for Family Guy, he said, quote, In the case of PTV, it came out of rage. Rage over all the crap we have to deal with since Janet Jackson showed her 67-year-old boob. The effects of Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction were being felt heavily by the team behind Family Guy. It was, after all, only the year prior that this incident took place when PTV aired. And PTV acted as an airing of the writer's frustration regarding the FCC. As far as an episode of Family Guy goes, PTV is really great. There are a ton of great jokes and gags that can be enjoyed without any knowledge of the history surrounding this episode. And the FCC song does a good job of summing up the frustrations of the team, and it's also incredibly catchy and funny. The episode follows a similar situation to the real-life incident surrounding Janet Jackson, except in PTV, it's David Hyde Pierce who has a wardrobe malfunction at the Emmys where he exposes one of his testicles. And also, David Hyde Pierce, that's a callback to the amazing screw-on-head video, so if you're Keep in notes, shared universe confirmed. After the incident within the episode, the FCC decides to crack down on anything offensive on TV. And when I say anything, I mean anything. It's the Van Show, starring Van Already, this premise is hilarious on its own. The censorship bits throughout this episode are all either really clever or stupidly funny. This censorship leads to Peter starting his own TV station called PTV, where he can air unedited episodes of his favorite shows and make his own shows that include all the depravity that the FCC so despises. Every show Peter features on PTV is filled with all the sex and toilet humor he could dream of. And on top of that, most of the shows Peter comes up with are really funny. The Peter Griffin side boob hour is a gag that has been permanently stuck in my brain since middle school. Lois doesn't share Peter's enthusiasm and chooses to notify the FCC, thus filling the role of a concerned parent looking out for the children. This leads us into the FCC musical number that the episode is widely known for. After the musical number, the FCC shuts down PTV, and this leads to Peter frustratingly stating that the FCC may be able to take away PTV, but they can never change who people are. The FCC decides to take this statement as a personal challenge, and they begin censoring Peter's life in an attempt to get Peter to clean it up. The scenes where Peter's life is being censored are all super funny, but there's one scene that shows a key key flaw with one clear aspect of censorship. The FCC begins censoring Peter any time he curses with an air horn, leading to a great scene where Peter begins talking about a sexual act Lois once performed with each indecent word censored by the air horn. No, I can't say in my own house. Great, Lois. Just great. You know, you're lucky you're good at my or I'd never put up with you. The problem I and many other viewers have with censoring curse words is the fact that usually it's easy to find out what word is being censored from the context of a scene. And with Family Guy being in the genre of adult animation, most if not all of the audience is going to be able to put together what's being said despite the censorship. And this begs the question, why censor curse words if the audience can easily decipher what's being said? Maybe you could make the argument that, oh, if you can understand it with the censor bleep, then there's really no reason to complain about it, because you already understand what they're saying, but this way it's not actually being played. 
To which I would argue back that, for one, I think it messes up the comedy timing sometimes of the joke being presented if there is a curse word in it, and two, it's just plain distracting from time to time to have an episode have a loud bleep playing to cover up a word being said by a character. It just rips you right out of the episode. Another argument that many in favor of this form of censorship will bring up is, well, what if a child hears it? And this is still a hotly debated subject, and it goes back to the very beginning of this story. When John Douglas heard George Carlin's Seven Words You Can't Say on Television on the radio, he was accompanied by his son. Protecting children from the corruption of indecency is the key talking point for many in favor of censorship. And PTV addresses this argument. Lois is concerned about the content being played on PTV, with the main show in question being Dogs Humping, a show Peter is very fond of, and Brian joins in on Peter and Lois's conversation to make yet another familiar argument in the realm of censorship. Lois, responsibility lies with the parents. There are plenty of things that are much worse for children than television. This tends to be the main kind of discourse surrounding censorship. One side says, think about the children, and the other side says, you think about your children, I want to watch Peter Griffin say fuck. To me, censorship in the form of beeping out curse words or blocking out nudity and violence can be okay, it just depends on the show in question. In the United States, we have television and film rating systems that act as a guide for the target demographic of the show or movie in question. Censoring things out to achieve a rating of PG-13 versus not censoring things and getting a rating of R is a decision that lies with the team or producers behind the project. If a show wants to censor out some curse words in order to get a TV-14 rating, rather than a TVMA, then they should do it. I have no problem with shows being censored to fit better with their target audience. But in the case of Family Guy, we're talking about adult animation. Adult animation, by definition, is made for adults and heavily leans into adult themes and humor. I think the rating system we have now is perfectly fine for informing audiences of what kinds of things to expect from a show or movie. But as I'm sure many would say on the other side of this argument, what about the children? What if a child accidentally tunes into a show with harmful content and is scarred for life? What if a child hears a disgusting phrase and repeats it at school? Or God forbid, church! Now this might sound controversial, but it's something I've learned from personal experience. Children will find a way to do things they want to do even if their parents don't want them to do it. That's sort of one of the things that children do. But I'm sure you're thinking, what the hell, Mr. Cow, an eight-year-old doesn't want to watch Breaking Bad and see a guy get zapped by a laser or whatever happens in Breaking Bad. And you are absolutely right. Except when I say children, I'm talking about the age range between 2 and 16. 1 and below are babies, and 17 and up is the age where people qualify to see TV, MA, and R-rated shows and movies, according to the rating system in place. 2 to 16 is the age range of children. Don't let the PG-13 and TV-14 fool you. Those two ratings are for slightly older children. Don't believe me? Well, let's go back to John Douglas driving with his son listening to George Carlin. According to Pacifica Reconsidered, implications for the current controversy over broadcast indecency by Angela J. Campbell of Georgetown Law, John Douglas originally referred to his son as simply young. However, later he would clarify that his son was 15 years old. Now, why is this important? Well, it's because this brings us to the strongest form of evidence for an argument that can ever be made. Anecdotal evidence the least scientific of all of the evidence. But it's uh, it's still evidence, and we're talking about Family Guy, so uh, maybe calm down a little bit, you know? It's for, uh, this is a Family Guy video. Anyways, <laughs> believe it or not, I wasn't allowed to watch Family Guy as a wee 13-year-old because my parents thought it was one, stupid, two, gross, and three, a waste of time, would you please just read a book or something? Unfortunately for my parents, technology has advanced to the point where information has never been more accessible, and while sometimes this technology can be used productively, most of the time it's used to watch Family Guy. So despite my parents' request, I found a way to watch Family Guy on an old laptop that was handed down to me. In fact, many of my siblings did the very same thing hiding our lust for Peter Griffin-related content from our parents. 
The point of this story is to show that if a child wants to watch something, they usually find a way to do it. It doesn't matter when the show airs or where it's streaming or what content warnings are put in place. Rebellious teenagers will find a way to watch Family Guy. And other stuff too, I guess, but this is a video about Family Guy and censorship, so just gonna focus on that. The truth is, when it comes to censorship, there really isn't any clear right answer. The Janet Jackson incident may have made audiences and networks paranoid about what was being put on TV, but it didn't really change anything about the situation we're in. Parents should be in charge of what their child watches, but children can be rebellious and find a way to watch indecent content anyways. You can censor adult content so it's more appropriate if a child should happen to see it, but then it's not really adult content. It's almost like this whole censorship debate when it comes to Family Guy and other adult comedy series is pointless. There's no perfect situation that's going to please everyone, and not every TV program and movie is going to be appropriate for everyone. Just because John Douglas found George Carlin's routine indecent doesn't mean other listeners would see it that way. At the end of PTV, Peter goes to Washington and gives an empowered speech about how various locations around Washington look like body parts. This speech persuades Congress and the FCC leaves TV and Peter alone. PTV is a celebration of sexual and indecent content on television. And the episode ends with the Griffin family enjoying an episode of The Brady Bunch that features literal toilet humor. The main message of PTV is largely to just leave TV alone and let the audience decide if it's something worth watching or something appropriate. While there is constant potential for incidents like Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction, at the end of the day, there's nothing that can really be done about it. And I think that's okay. There's no way for a parent or even a government agency to police everything that plays on television. Or the internet for that matter. That place is fucked up. You can't clean up entertainment en masse without changing what people enjoy watching. People enjoy trashy reality TV and sitcoms with sexual content and adult animation with gross out humor and fart jokes. They may not always overlap, but if there is an audience for a kind of show, then chances are that show is going to be made. This might sound great to many of us who love edgy humor and graphic content, but for the people out there with families and children, things can seem kind of hopeless. Parents want what's best for their kids, and if they think a TV show is going to affect them negatively, then they'll do whatever it takes to shelter their child from it. Whether you believe curse words and toilet humor to be a blight on society or not, it's still part of the world. You can't just cover up these things with bleeps and censor bars and take the concept of whatever is being shown out of the world. Everything that is censored is something that does actually exist in this world, whether it be violence, harsh language, toilet humor, sexual situations, nudity, or any of the other things that tend to be censored on TV. Audiences and entertainment have changed a lot since John Douglas was driving around with his son in 1973, and they've changed since PTV aired back in 2005. Leaving entertainment alone and letting audiences decide what's tasteful and distasteful seems like a perfect situation. But of course, there is always the variable of the unexpected, the what-ifs of the situation. I could sit here all day and come up with hypothetical situations that show the supposed dangers of uncensored television, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Now more than ever, it's easy for audiences to find what they're looking for no matter how niche it is. So if there's something someone wants to see and it's not on TV, maybe it'll be in a movie. And if not a movie, definitely on the internet. It's the unexpected that worries people so much about not censoring entertainment. Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction shows us that much. But you can't predict the unpredictable nature of television, especially when it comes to live events like the Super Bowl halftime show. People always want to think about the children, despite children slowly learning how to think for themselves and sneaking Family Guy once they get to high school. What the fuck? There really is no perfect solution or answer in the case of censorship, and I could go in circles all day arguing for both sides, trying to come to a definitive conclusion. But for right now, I think the best course of action is just to let things be. Let the audience decide what's worth watching. And if you're still worried about the world collapsing or indecent language or any of these things that are widely out of your control, there's really only one thing you can do. Thanks, Granddad. 
granddad, what do you do when you can't do nothing, but there's nothing you can do? You do what you can. Thank you all very much for watching this video. I know it's been a hot minute since I uploaded, but this video uh, just spiraled out of control. It got way longer than I thought it was going to be. I had a lot more to say than I thought I would. There's a lot of interesting history, and it was super fun to make and go over. So thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. I know it took a while, but I have a couple of quicker videos coming up for the holiday season. One that is familiar, I guess. One that I've done a video on before, but uh, it was a while ago and I have changed my opinions somewhat. So surprise waiting for you there around Christmas time. And then of course, at the end of the year, I have to do best and worst adult animation of 2023. There's a bunch of stuff I have to talk about on there. I will probably talk about all the movies I've seen in that video as well. So that one will probably be pretty large as well, but I don't see it taking anywhere near as long to edit as a video like this with all the research and the multiple takes and intersplicing footage. So more stuff coming more frequently in the future, hopefully, especially before the new year. And thanks for all of your support, everybody. The channel is doing fantastic and I owe it all to you. Let me know what you thought of this video in the comment section below. I am curious, I will upload the script to a new blog I started where I'm just gonna upload scripts that I've written because I sometimes write scripts for fun and for practice. So if you wanna see that, you can, uh, you can see fan scripts I've written, I guess, but also scripts to videos if you ever wanna see how those get put together and also uh, work cited for all the sources I went over. I'll have little things on the bottom of the screen, of course, like you saw in this video showing the sources, but if you want a direct link to them, it'll be in that script. There's a lot of really cool tools uh, and assets in that, or I guess just one really cool to, uh, tool, which is uh, oh yeah, uh, a service all about the Supreme Court and digitizing all of those records. That was indispensable in making this video. So big ups to those guys. But this has turned into a pretty long outro, so I will leave it there. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe, all that great stuff. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.